Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on RealLibertyMedia.com and RLMRadio.xyz. Ah, yeah, folks, it is a Monday evening once again, and I am here with you. My name is Grimnir, and this is the Grim Leftovers Program. Yes, it is. Uh, this is episode, what, 67, I think? Uh, yeah, episode 67. So, um, welcome to the show. Uh, it's Monday night, April 13, 2020. Monday the 13th. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> yeah, man, how the hell y'all doing out there? Uh, you enjoying your uh, lockdown? You enjoying being a, a prisoner? Yeah, nothing like that, huh? Prisoner by fiat. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, today, uh, I, I, I had to go to the post office. I had some, uh, I sold some stuff on eBay. And I, so I had to go down to the post office. And, and I, I haven't been there during the day or when the other people were around there for at least a couple of months now since all this nonsense started. Um, but I had to go down there today, and uh, they have they have there in the post office uh, lines, lines on the floor to keep you six feet away from other people. Of course, that's only six feet away while you're standing there in line. As other people walk by you, they're not six feet away. They can't be because there's no way for them to arrange that so they can walk by and get to the door or from the door, <laughs> at six feet. Now, there were some people wearing masks there at the post office. There was probably seven or eight people there at the post office today. Uh, and so some of the people were wearing masks, um, but just a few, uh, or just a couple, I would say, uh, except for the, uh, uh, it was kind of funny, the uh, woman at the counter that, that, that takes the packages there. Uh, she had a mask on, but the mask was down like on her chin. <laughs> and then they put up these like plexiglass barriers uh, there in front of the counter, but there's a big old like a 12 inch gap underneath uh, uh, the the plexiglass barrier there. <laughs> well, it's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> anyway, good times at the post office here in Moriarty, New Mexico. Let me tell you. Uh, so that's that's all right. That's all right. Um. <laughs> what else going on here at RLM? I don't know. I guess everything's going fine here at RLM. Uh, the, the new stream seems to be working out just fine. I'm a little concerned about it at the beginning, uh, mainly because of the way the auto DJ works, but uh, eh, eh, whatever. It, it's it's deal, deal withable. Deal withable. Is that a word? Deal withable? <laughs> uh, anyway, I personally, I'm fine. I got no... Uh, Nothing, no diseases of any kind. Unless I picked some up at the post office today, I don't know. I could have. Oh, no! <laughs> nah, I didn't. Uh, even if I did, big deal. I'm a healthy guy. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm in good shape. Well, well, you know, I'm not really in good shape, but I'm a healthy guy. <laughs> oh, boy. So uh, hopefully you're all doing fine out there on your end of the world wherever you may be, because um, uh, I, I want you all to be good. I want you all to be fine, especially my RLM peeps. You know, all those folks I don't know, I, 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 you know, I don't want them to be not fine either, but if they are, I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think, I'm pretty sure uh, this is just, just a big old rigged up hoax. Uh, to to do nasty things to you I, and everybody else, roll in the uh, total on militarized state, uh, the surveillance state, all, all kinds of other stuff. I mean, not like we already didn't have a huge surveillance state going on, because we certainly did. Um. <laughs> yeah, it sucked. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> so anyway, say hi and howdy to all the folks out there, to various places you may be tuned in from whether that's right here on reallibertymedia.com or over there on rlmradio.xyz, freedomsnetwork.com, realliberty.org, or possibly, possibly, 
you're on tune in. Yeah, we have tune in back. I, I, I mentioned that on Friday night during the Freakers Ball, but uh, yeah, we're not, we're not going to be getting internet radio back. Uh, there's just some stuff that I, I can't deal with uh, on that uh, as far as them and uh, working with an ice cast stream versus a shot cast stream. So uh, we're not going to be getting internet radio back, but we got tune in going, so that's cool. Um, those are all where the, where the live stream goes now. Uh, I, I don't know if there's other people picking on the stream up out there. If they are, thanks. Um, <laughs> but if they're not, that's okay too. Okay, let's get let's get on into it here. We got we got a bunch of stories. I got more stories than usual because uh, none of these are really in depth stories that I got for you today. But we're gonna start with something weird, weird. Uh, and, 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 and I would like last week say a coronavirus, corona-free show, but it's not. I have some corona-based or mm, adjacent, corona-adjacent stories, uh, put it that way. <laughs> but but uh, this first one is not one of them. This first story comes off of Wired.com, posted on the 2nd of March. You think flash floods are bad? Buckle up for... Flash droughts. Flash droughts. That's 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 not even a possibility, is it? No, no. But they say it is. A typical drought is a slow motion catastrophe, but scientists are trying to figure out a phenomenon called a flash drought. Now it says here they're trying to figure it out. What I say they're doing is they're trying to create it. They're trying to classify something they can call. A flash drought, which forms in as little as two weeks. So in, in late, this is by, by the way, Steve Prohl. Uh, is that the guy that wrote this? I think it is. I, I don't know. Uh, anyway, he's, he's, he's getting uh, uh, credit for the photograph that they have here, which whatever. Uh, anyway, in late spring of 2012, climatic chaos descended upon the Midwest and Great Plains in the midst of a growing season. A drought is supposed to unfold on a timeline of seasons to years. But in two weeks, between June 12th and June 26th, the High Plains went from what a monitoring group called abnormally dry to severe drought. Hmm. I wonder about this monitoring group. They are that the, the affected area ballooned from covering 30% of the continental US in May to over 60% by August with the agricultural losses tallying tens of billions of dollars. The region had crashed into a flash drought. Think of it like a flash flood only far bigger and therefore far more consequential. It's a phenomenon science is just beginning to understand, eh, is beginning to manufacture, I'm going to say, let alone predict. But today, the journal Nature Climate Change, uh-oh, it's the journal Nature Climate Change. Huh, is there an agenda? Two dozen researchers, atmospheric scientists, computer scientists, climate scientists, and more are publishing a perspective piece trying to get their community to agree on a standard definition for a flash drought. Yeah, yeah, there's no agenda here. And to set research priorities for the future. Why, for instance, do flash droughts happen in the first place? Eh, they don't. But you're making up, making something up that you could sell to the public, uh, the masses. So I understand where you're coming from and why you're coming from there. How can scientists get a be get better at predicting them and giving water managers warning? Water managers. Mm. And if climate change is making the world drier in general, which of course it's not, because climate change has always existed. <laughs> what does that mean for flash droughts? I think the challenge with the drought, just in general, that makes it so much different than any other hazard, much more challenging and very costly, is the fact that it has a very 
potentially large spatial footprint and very potentially long temporal fo footprint, says Mark Savaboboda, uh, director of the National Drought Mitigation Center. Oh, mitigation. They're loving that word now, ain't they? They are loving that word mitigation at this point. Oh, they're, they're all, they're mitigating all over that corona crap. <laughs> and co-author on the new paper. Compared to a flood, earthquake, hur hurricane, tornado, uh, they have a very relatively small impact area and last a very short amount of time. Here's the first tricky bit. Calling a drought a drought is both an objective and subjective science. Subjective science. Subjective science. Hmm. All right. <laughs> the objective side comes from raw data about precipitation and soil moisture. I can get behind that, but there are also these things that are coming out uh, or coming from people on the ground, their opinions and their subjective observations. Opinions and subjective observations. That's not science. According to Angeline Pendergrass, an atmospheric scientist for the National Center for Atmospheric Research and a lead author on the new paper. And this is, uh, <laughs> and so this is a very rich data set, but it's also not entirely objective. <laughs> yeah, throw that data right out the window. That, that data is useless. That's not data. That's somebody <laughs> Somebody making shit up. Hey, Donna. Oh, I didn't say hi to all the folks in the chat. Hi, all the folks in the chat. <laughs> By the way, if you're out there listening and you're not in the chat, come on over, reallibertymedia.com, and jump on in through the chat applet there, or just fire up your IRC uh, client application and, and, and get on in here and say hi and howdy to all the wonderful folks that we got here today. We got some good folks here. We got we, we got Cowboy Tech. I see Cowboy Tech calling me famous, I am not famous, and the Beetle, and Moose Girl, and the Vanna White Bot, and Mr. Sock Puppet and his clean plate, ready for who knows who's serving up what here, um, <laughs> Donna, damn Van Meter, uh, Rob Works, and uh, who else we got, I know Kate's out there probably listening, hey Kate, um, hey, what's going on with my scroller here, all right, we got Hansel, Jay Dredd, how you doing Hansel, I got a story uh, for you later on man, how you doing Hans? Uh, and I'll just, I don't know who all's in here talking. Vinny, Vinny is back with us today. Hey, Vinny. And we got, we got, we got Chloe in another place, another secret place. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> that's, uh, there, there's plenty more to that flash drought story, should you care to read about subjective science. <laughs> oh, boy. Now, this next story. I don't know where you sign up. I don't. I don't know where you sign up, but I mean, hell, I'm, I want to sign up. <laughs> this is posted on unilad.co.uk. Unilad on February 29th. So uh, here it is. Nurse wants China to assign her a boyfriend as a reward for fighting coronavirus. I told you I had some uh, coronavirus um, adjacent stories. All right, Vinny, have a good time there in town. All right. So they got a picture here of this girl that, that that's looking for, for China to assign her a boyfriend. And um, she's hot. She's hot. Some Chinese chick, man. I, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, she, she's, a, she's, a, she's, a, she's a nice. Anyway, a single nurse working in Wuhan, China, to fight the coronavirus outbreak has asked the government to assign her a boyfriend. Why? She's she's a babe. Why would she need the government to assign her a boyfriend? Uh, the Tian Fang Fang said she hopes the country can assign me a boyfriend when the epidemic is over after a long day working at a makeshift hospital. The 30-year-old posed for a photo while still wearing her hazmat suit and a pair of goggles, holding up a piece of paper containing the message before sharing it on social media. Who the hell's calling me? Well, whoever it is, say, look, I'm going to have to wait because I'm talking on the radio here. 
<laughs> soon uh, the medical can you hear that phone ringing uh, soon uh, the medical professional's post went viral and she confessed she was surprised to find out the whole nation now knows I'm looking for a partner uh, she wrote the note on Tuesday February 25th after being inspired by a colleague who had written I want a boyfriend on her hazmat suit uh, speaking to the in in independent media outlet I can't pronounce. Fang Fang revealed she's looking for a tall man because she's five foot six inches in height. I'm six foot. I'm tall enough. However, at the moment, she said her most important duty is looking after patients with the coronavirus. Yeah. Fang Fang is one of many medical professionals uh, sent by the province of Hunan, which borders Hubei, to treat a large number of coronavirus patients in Wuhan. Woohoo, Han! Uh, <laughs> here's to hoping she finds Mr. Wright. So, uh, those of you that um, are fans of women of the Asian persuasion, uh, take a look. Take a look. Tell me that wouldn't be worth a, a try. <laughs> The links, for those of you not in the chat, will be in the post-show blog. Uh, so don't you worry. You can go look at her later. <laughs> now, again, though, the problem the problem is when you have – she is cute, isn't she, Beetle? Uh, when you have a relationship with somebody and they're, like, living with you, and you have this coronavirus crap going on, and <laughs> – you're a, you're a paranoid, freaked out person because uh, because of the fact that you're watching all this fear porn, hearing all this fear porn being poured into your head. Let me give you a clue: what might happen if you actually did have a live-in with you? From the New York Post, March the third, two thousand twenty. Man locks woman in bathroom over fear she might have coronavirus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, boy, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, got, I, I, I saw I posted something. Oh, there she is, Fang Fang. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Ain't she cute? All right. <laughs> All right. To hell with in sickness and in health. A Lithuanian man worried about catching the coronavirus threw domestic bliss out the window by locking his wife in the bathroom for fear she might have the deadly illness, according to a report. The germaphobic hubby took the extreme measure after finding out that his wife had met a Chinese woman, probably not Fang Fang, who had traveled to hard-hit Italy. He claimed to have forced her into quarantine in the Vilnius apartment only after consulting on the phone with doctors on how to keep COVID-19 at bay, the news re outlet reported. His wife managed to, managed to call cops from the bathroom and ask for help. As a precaution, she was tested for the virus and found to be clear and has declined to press charges against her husband. Uh, so far, there was only one confirmed case of corona in Lithuania. <laughs> so, <laughs> if your um, significant other, significant living other, um, uh, coughs or sneezes or, or, or looks like they might be running a temperature or something like that, then, then possibly uh, you might want to lock them in the bathroom. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Next. <laughs> All right. You might laugh, but this could happen to you. No, no, it couldn't. None of y'all are that dumb. <laughs> March 4th, 2020. ABC13.com. Woman finds out Plant she's watered for two years is fake. She's been watering a fake plant for two years. 
A woman who spent two years watering a succulent, she had, which really, you don't even really need to water a succulent, hardly ever, but whatever. She said she was so proud of, recently learned it was fake. <laughs> Kaylee Wilkes shared a funny story on Facebook, which has since gone viral. Wilkes said she found out the plant was fake while she was trying to move it into a new vase. I decided it was time to transplant I found the cutest vase, Wilkes wrote. I I I I I go go to pull it from the original plastic container to learn this plant was also plastic. Fake uh, Wilkes described the plant as full with beautiful coloring and was just an overall perfect plant. In reality the succulent was plastic and sat on a styrofoam base uh, sand with uh, sand glued on top. I felt like these last two years have been a lie. Eh, you've probably been a moron your whole life, Miss Wilkes. Um, <laughs> I don't know, but... <laughs> Ever since she published her story on Facebook, it has been shared thousands of times and even caught the attention of Home Depot. The hardware store chain was quick to send her a real succulent. Uh, the whole, they, Home Depot, found the, the closest Home Depot and had them... I uh, had, had them on my doorstep the same day. Uh, the plant was originally a gift from the father of Wilkes' children, who... That's an odd way to phrase that. From the father of Wilkes' children. Okay. Uh, baby daddy, uh, who also thought it was real. When asked about how he reacted upon learning it was fake, she said, he thinks it's hilarious. And so do I. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> yeah, I got this beautiful garden growing. Oh, but they're all fake plants. <laughs> all right. This next article is is just more informational, instructional than anything else. I myself, having never used a vape or a vape cartridge, um really i don't know if any of this is correct information or not i'm not a vapor maybe some of the chatters can tell me if this is accurate uh, it probably is but i don't know it's on a website called internationalhighlife.com posted on september 30th of 2019 how to get the very last drops out of a vape cartridge Likely, if you love to vape, you've ended up with a handful of half-empty or faulty cartridges or pens laying around. They just don't make them like they used to, or do they? Um, bad cartridges are everywhere. It seems wasteful to simply throw away these cartridges, even if it's, de if it's defective or the original vape pen no longer works properly. It's packed full of highly potent extract, and one day, you plan on getting it out. For many of us, throwing away a partially full cartridge, cartridge seems sacrilegious. It would seem that way to me. So instead, we keep them stored in a stash box or junk drawer until we figure out what to do with them. Does this sound all too familiar? I, I may have already done the story, Moose Girl, but it's okay. It's a PSA. Public service announcement. It's it's educational. <laughs> All right. So today is the day where we should you uh, we should you how what we show you how maybe not we should you how we show you how to get the very last drops out of empty or defective cartridges. So dig through those junk drawers and uh, your weed stash. Let's get to work. Precautions. Some YouTube stoners <laughs> recommended smashing the cartridges to get the good stuff out. Literally, breaking into your THC concentrate cartridge is not only dangerous, but desperate. If you follow the below steps, uh, there should be absolutely no broken glass and no mess. Do not use fire to heat the device or, uh, or, or the concentrate in the device. Vape pens and other such devices were never designed to encounter the flame from a lighter or blowtorch. A blowtorch! 
if you try to heat the cartridge with fire, you have to consider what else you might be heating. Plastics, heavy metals, and glues could quickly transfer from the device into the concentrate. Where does the concentrate, concentrate go? Straight into your lungs. Therefore, you do not use fire, lighters, torches, or anything else to heat the cartridge. Know when to give up. While the following options should work for most cartridges on the market, uh, today we haven't tried them all. Uh, there very well may be a cartridge which doesn't give up the final dregs of THC that easily. Uh, in this case, you'll want to toss it. Your health and safety and time are not worth a few dollars at most of cannabis extract. So here we go. How to get the last drops out of a vape pen. Uh, for those with a faulty bubble cartridge, uh, skip ahead to the next section. For those who are just trying to get the dregs of concentrate from the bottom of your cartridge, this section is for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, you don't want to get high from those glues, Beetle. Uh, if you do, you don't want to put it into your lungs. <laughs> That's for... Option one, heating pad. Uh, most of the time... Uh, all you'll need to, to loosen the thick concentrate in the more localized area of the cartridge is heat. If you have a heating pad for growing weed, throw your leftover cartridges on the heating pad overnight. Within a few hours, they should have liquefied, and you should score a few more powerful pulls out of it. Option 2. Air Exchange for register in your house. As one helpful Redditor pointed out, you can uh, sit all of the leftover mouthpiece up on up up <laughs> in up and in <laughs> floor heat. That's a tough uh, combination of words there. Uh, register first. Remove the battery, and the cartridge should sit nicely between the slats. So long as the heat is on in your house, it won't take much for the oil to move around closer to the interior heating element. Option number three carefully pry it open. Carefully. This option largely depends on what kind of vape pen you use, but often you can pry them open with a little careful effort. Pull apart the various elements using small tools, needle nose pliers, screwdrivers, etc., until you gain access to the concentrate. Use a toothpick to smudge the residual THC out and dab it into a pipe or a blunt paper. It makes for a great smoke, even with a tiny dab. If you end up breaking the glass, toss the entire cartridge. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Getting rid of the, uh, the bubble in a faulty cartridge. Every so often, you are bound to encounter a defective vape cartridge where a bubble annoyingly interrupts your vape experience. No matter how hard or how long you uh, haul on the mouthpiece, the bubble prevents any more liquid from hitting the heating element. Option number one, use a hair dryer. Remember when we said never heat a vape pan with an open flame? A hair driver, dryer is a safe and effective alternative. Remove the battery. First, first off, remove the battery from the cartridge and set aside. Place the cartridge mouthpiece side up, fastener side down, on a table, uh, you can use masking tape or styrofoam or whatever as a means to stabilize the bottom during this process. Turn the hair dryer on low and point it, at, point it at the cartridge. It should sit 12 inches away from the cartridge to start. You can move it closer if you have to later. Blow the hot air on the cartridge until you see movement inside the bubble. The concentrate heats up and begins to liquefy. The bubble should soon move out of the way and pop near the surface. The remaining liquid back down uh, is back in action and ready to vape. Option number two, double down with a second cartridge. If the first option doesn't work, another suggestion is to use the power of gravity. This option requires a secondary full or partially full cartridge from the same brand or at least the same universal screw tip. Use a tiny bit of masking tape. Link the screw ends of the two cartridges together uh, so they are perfectly lined up. You, you want to move the liquid from one cartridge into the other so, so the better the alignment, the less messy the process. 
Use a small bit of styrofoam or your fingers to hold the two cartridges upright. Uh, the defective cartridges should be on the bottom and the full one on top. Turn the hair dryer to low and blow towards the cartridges. Move closer as the liquid build, uh, heat liquid heats up. You'll see a bubble in the bottom cartridge begin to move upward. It should dislodge and travel through the connection. Uh, during this movement, some liquid from the full cartridge will go uh, in the opposite direction to fill the bottom one. Once the bubble has disappeared into the top cartridge, turn the hairdryer off. While still warm, uh, disconnect the cartridges and invert to make sure the product is next to the heating element and ready to vape. We can all agree that one downside to vape pens is their disposable nature. Passionate vapors seem to collect empty, or worse, half-empty cartridges like it's going out of style. These cartridges are impossible to recycle in most cases, and wasteful to throw out. So we all keep them, hoping one day, one day, we'll get the very last drops out. The good news, it's generally not that difficult to get a few more good pulls out of an empty cartridge. For any defective ones, you only need a hair dryer or a heating pad to correct the problem. Instead of shoving that leftover and faulty THC-laden cartridge into the back of your junk drawer, use these helpful tips to get it out. Get that final drop out and a very final, very satisfactory inhale. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's tough, man. You don't want to throw out any, any, any good little high-making material. <laughs> All right, all right. This next story, I, 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 I debated on whether or not I was going to cover it uh, here at all, but I'll just, I'll just do it in brief uh, because I think y'all know about. Hopefully, everybody knows about this by now, and you should have known about it for a long time. Although they're just finally getting around uh, to pushing the legislation through uh, using uh, Corona as a cover. But here you go, from agoristnexus.com posted here no date on here when was when, the date on here oh March 2nd okay the state the state the evil state is comparing encryption tech to terrorism terrorism here's why you should care this is by Jeremiah Harding. Some of y'all may be familiar with Jeremiah Harding. I follow him over there on the Twitter. He's, he's, a, he's a sharp dude. Anyway, um, he, he says, I have been invited to write for this outlet, and there's never been a better time to start diversifying a portfolio in terms of the amount and variety of communications you put out there. There are many reasons I say this, but... One of the primary reasons is that the U.S. government, the evil state, is cracking down on alternative forms of communication actively. Not only that, but they're comparing uh, people who tell the truth to terrorists. Hey, that guy's telling the truth. He's a terrorist. He's a criminal. And more. In a document signed by the Trumpster and published by the uh, United States National Counterintelligence, which is a, kind of a good name for them. They counterintelligence. They are against intelligence. <laughs> and Security Center, uh, WikiLeaks was thrown under the bus. Oh, yeah, they threw WikiLeaks under the bus day one, along with a host of other people who the trump a -phonian, yes, trump a -phonian, uh, has tapped to boost his campaign and keep his numbers high. It reads, The number of actors targeting the United States is growing. Russia and China operate globally, uh, use all instruments of national power to target the United States, and have a broad range of sophisticated intelligence capabilities. Other state adversaries, such as Cuba, Iran, and North Korea, Non-state actors such as Lebanese, Le Le Lebanese, Hezbollah, which I think is spelled wrong, ISIS, which is a creation of Israel in the United States, and Al-Qaeda, Al which we know where that comes from, 
as well as transnational criminal organizations and ideologically motivated entities such as hacktivists, hacktivists, leaktivists, <laughs> nice wording, and public disclosure organizations, public disclosure organizations, people that tell the truth about stuff they don't want you to know about, and also pose significant threats. Additionally, foreign nationals with no formal ties to foreign intelligence services steal sensitive data and intellectual property, do they now? Now, to those of you who have gallows humor <laughs> as your primary source of coping, I have, I have a serious case of gallows humor. <laughs> As your primary source of coping and comfort in times like these, feel free to laugh. Feel free to laugh. <laughs> and all the people who claimed that the Trumpster was a great victory for the freedom of the press, speech, and organization. For additional humor, remember how many times he has praised WikiLeaks while he was on the campaign trail because of the way they consistently oppose Hillary and other establishment scumbag uh, uh, politicians and the way in a way that benefited him and his campaign. This is the same person who later said he had no idea who WikiLeaks was after after uh, was after being pressed on their involvement in sharing leaks of the Hillary Clinton emails. This is the same person who has repeatedly said that he loves WikiLeaks so much that when he claimed he never heard of them, a ton of outlets and social media commentators were very quick to build compilations of him praising WikiLeaks publicly. Why? Why turn against these people that helped you out? I don't get it, Donald. Not only does one of them, uh, not only does none of that seem to matter to him now, and not only does he seem totally willing to throw allies under the bus when they are no longer useful to him, like some kind of yesterday's garbage, but someone connected with him, <coughs> excuse me, a little uh, corona cough there, uh, uh, connected with him, told Assange the only way he would get a pardon is if he completely disavowed Russia's involvement in the U.S. election. At least, that's what his lawyers say. All right, well, I, it go, it go, I'm not even going to bother with the rest of this, uh, because there, there's a lot of stuff in here, and I didn't want to get too deep into it. I didn't even get to the part uh, about what, what the state is doing uh to this and why you should care about all this, uh, but 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 you but you should. Hey Dan, how you doing? Dan Tennessee has joined us here in the chat, so uh, welcome Dan. All right, um, uh, there there's uh, some really good information, and and if you're unaware, there there is now uh, an anti-encryption piece of legislation that has been slipped through the Congress under the guise of national security, as, as they do with everything, under the guise of national security and under cover of corona. So nobody gets to see it, because nobody sees anything while this corona crap is going on. <sighs> but speaking of presidents, <laughs> and speaking of Russia, <laughs> from RT.com on March 8th, why coronavirus should be the next U.S. president. That's right. Coronavirus should be the next president. <laughs> With Super Tuesday results in, some Democrats are worried about whether or not Joe Biden can beat Donald Trump. Well, yeah, because Joe Biden doesn't even know where he's at at any point in time. He's, he's he's lost it. That guy, I don't know if he ever had it in the first place, but if he did have it, it's gone. Some feel the same about Bernie Sanders, which doesn't matter any longer because, well, he dropped out. And I'm pretty sure I heard today that Joe Biden is actually uh, now supporting 
Uh, I mean, uh, Bernie Sanders now supporting Joe Biden. <laughs> Maybe it's time for something more effective. The coronavirus. It may be a time when true political revolution is needed for America. One that's even more radical than when Bernie Sanders has run on oh, with his I can't believe it's not communism approach. A more stable campaign than Joe Biden's wait, where am I again? Uh, could really deliver. The Democrats need something stable. They need something with a goal. They need something with focus. Well, what has more of that than a virus, specifically the coronavirus? <laughs> In fact, the coronavirus has accomplishments to its name already. It never made any bones about what its goal is uh, and what it's good at. It, it makes people sick and sometimes kills them. Uh, both are traditional pastimes for American presidents. In politics, it's good to have a consistent message and you're not going to get a more consistent you're not going to get more consistent than that not to mention it has already been promoting us foreign policy goals just look at iran what the us started with the assassination of qasim soleimani the coronavirus has been dutifully keeping up Mohammed Maramahabahabandi, <laughs> some guy, I don't know, an Iranian expediency council member and advisors to Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei died from coronavirus on Monday and senior dip diplomat Hossein Shikolasalasam, whatever, followed on Thursday. More reports about high-ranking Tehran officials getting infected are coming in every day. A leader like coronavirus could quite easily show that those who chant death to America should fear their next cough. Not to mention, it saves the United States money on ammunition. Then there's the issue of the Chinese economy. Trump's trade wars have been a point of debate on both sides of the political aisle. But we need something faster. We need something more decisive. We need coronavirus. Think about it. What else has been more harmful for Chinese econ uh, China's economy than the coronavirus over the last 10 years? Nothing. Ultimately, who else could we trust to have such an effort? I mean, we humans can really only do so much. Coronavirus, on the other hand, can make sure that we keep China's markets in check. <laughs> There's also the presence of the U.S. around the globe. We're all about protecting our interests around the globe, on the global scale. Just look at any map of U.S. military bases across the world. Well, with the coronavirus leading the way, we can do it easier than before. Imagine how many fewer ships and military bases we could need if our president literally had unstoppable tendrils in every country on the planet. It's important to both have a strong hand and, and conserve our resources. And I honestly couldn't think of a better way. We, can, uh, we can't forget the environment, no. Th the environment, though, not to mention whether people admit it in public or not. We're all tired of hearing a freaking Greta complain about everything. So why not use something more effective than a whiny 17-year-old girl? That's why where coronavirus comes in. According to many folks who seem to agree with Greta, planes are the, the bane of climate. Well, who has caused more, caused more canceled flights than coronavirus? Clearly, coronavirus has a care for the environment that is completely unmatched. Coronavirus is truly a hero for the ozone layer. Or maybe not. I saw a report today that the largest ozone uh, hole ever has opened up in the last couple of months over the Arctic. Uh, anyway, so uh, uh, let's, let's talk about, uh, anyway, so <laughs> coronavirus uh, is truly a zero. Da, 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 da. Um, uh, keeping humans inside their homes and feasting on anything with vitamin C with the hopes of staying healthy. This is the true way to be environmentally friendly, people. As it stands, it's rather clear that Biden and Sanders can't stand against Trump. 
<laughs> blindingly clear. <laughs> Those two clowns, by no, oh, horrible. Anyway, only coronavirus can save the day from the bad orange man. So vote coronavirus. The worst thing that can happen is that it kills us all. Right? <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> Go Corona. <laughs> All right. Hope springs eternal. Yes, indeed, but boys and girls. Hope sp I, I may go a little long today. We'll, we'll see. I, I may go a little bit long. Well, we'll see. <laughs> From SputnikNews.com. Uh, posted on uh, the, the, the 7th of March. Four kilometer wide asteroid to closely approach Earth in less than two months. What? Four kilometer wide? That's big enough to do some serious damage. How close is close? Well, NASA's Center for Near Earth Objects, the CNEOs, located in California, is tasked with detecting and tracking space objects that come particularly close to our planet, as it is believed that asteroids larger than one kilometer in diameter could have a dramatic consequences for our home. Bring it on, babies! All right, an asteroid measuring between 1.8 kilometers and 4.1 kilometers in diameter will closely approach Earth on the 29th of April. So we're talking less than two weeks here. Or about two weeks, yeah. <laughs> the 29th of April, the CNEO's tracking list revealed the near-Earth object, the NEO, is officially called 52768, or 1998-OR2, and previously came close to Earth on the 12th of March, 2009. This object is moving at a speed of about 8.7 kilometers per second, but there is no need to panic, as it will only approach Earth at a distance of around 0 0.04205 astronomical units. How far? <laughs> For comparison, one astronomical unit equals about 150 million kilometers, roughly the distance between the Sun and our planet. Meaning that 1998 OR2 is unlikely to find itself closer uh, to us than 6.29 million kilometers um, on the 29th of April. Dang! So close. So close. <laughs> Come on down! 1999, 1998 OR2, come on down. You're the next contestant on who's got to screw up the earth. <laughs> who's got to break the earth. Yeah, coronavirus really ain't doing it, although they're trying to convince us it is. Yes, the corona is just petering. It's just not doing its job. What we need is 1998 OR2. Come on down. All right. Hansel, Hansel, are you tuned in? Hansel. <laughs> All right, here it is. Here it is. From the metro.co.uk, uh, posted on March 9th, 2020. Why am I calling out Hansel? <laughs> no reason. No reason. This really has nothing at all to do with him. <laughs> A dating app for small... <laughs> Let me start that again. <laughs> a dating app for small penises is here because of the pressure to be big. <laughs> I could, even reading it to myself, I couldn't get through that line without laughing. <laughs> Contrary to popular belief, Bigger isn't always better when it comes to penises. In fact, and ladies, you can tell me if this is true. In fact, women prefer an average-sized penis 
over a large one. Is that right? Are you? Is that correct? <laughs> and men, if you're worried about the size of your schlong, please listen to your partners if they say it doesn't matter. If you still don't believe them, you can sign up to Dinky One. <laughs> Dinky One. <laughs> A dating app for those with small willies and those who enjoy it. Oh, you're unlikely to startle anyone in the bedroom if they know what to expect from the get-go. Dinky One aims to normalize men with little dicks in a world with an increasing pressure to measure up to certain standards. A spokesman for the app explained, Body image is generally within your control, but penis size, not unless you undergo surgery. In addition, the Internet is packed with false claims and products to increase your penis size. Many young men now think that you need a 12-inch long to satisfy your partner. Not really the case. It's not the case, I can tell you from personal experience. I don't have a 12-inch long, and I've pleased many a woman uh anyway this is <laughs> either that or they're all very good actresses <laughs> one of the two this is simply not the case and our dating site is here to normalize the situation a dinky one has gained 27,762 members uh, since its launch 27 percent identify as women, whatever that means, and 71% 71, identify as men, which potential suitors sign up, and they can choose from 24 gender identities. No, not not twenty, not 62 members, 27,762 members. Did I read that wrong? All right, so when you sign up, you can choose from 24 gender identities. <laughs> How? Anyway, uh, including non-binary or androgynous. They can also remain anonymous and can opt in to receive hints and tips on finding their match. The site, which bans nudity, well, how, how could you give them a picture of your tiny schlong if you're, if you're banning nudity? Or overly sexualized images insists there are numerous reasons why people prefer little dicks. Vienna sausages. <laughs> it says there are women who just prefer a smaller penis for comfort reasons and still rate the sex highly from a smaller endowed man. <laughs> oh, there are also women. <laughs> Also, women who enjoy the smaller man more as they tend to compensate for size with additional skills, such as the more experience of the oral sex and uh, foreplay. It added that gay men are split on the topic, with a forum thread suggesting most prefer a bigger size, but some do not. The platform can be used as either a website or a mobile app, so you can get your little dicks on the go. Users can add up to nine pictures and reveal their location, age, gender, and sexuality, and can write a 500-character flirt message. <sighs> so, you women out there, do you like the you you, you like it when little willy 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 <laughs> little willy willy won't come home. <laughs> all right, all right. Oh God. <laughs> all right. Anybody do yoga? I don't I don't do yoga. I've never done yoga. I've seen people doing it. It looks kinda of interesting. And I, I don't know. Do you do you at the end of a yoga se session say Namaste? Namaste. Well, if you live in Alabama and you have kids and they're doing yoga, not going to happen. Because even prior to now, those kids couldn't even do yoga. At least not in a public school. Of course, there's no public schools right now, so whatever. 
Anyway, <laughs> Fox 2, KTVU.com, March 8th. Alabama may end ban on yoga in schools, but kids will not be able to say namaste. That's right. Alabama lawmakers might lift a decades-old ban on yoga in public schools, but why would you ban yoga? <laughs> but the bill would keep the greeting namaste on the forbidden list. The bill by Rep Representative Jeremy Gray, a Democratic legislator, that figures, from Opalaka, is on the proposed debate agenda uh, Tuesday in the Alabama House of Representatives. The bill says that the local school systems can decide if they want to teach yoga poses and stretches. However, the moves and exercises taught to students must have highly exclusively English names. English names to non-English moves. According to the legislation, it would also prohibit the use of chanting, mantras, and teaching the greeting namaste. <laughs> Am I saying that right? I'm pretty sure that's how you say it. Namaste. The Alabama Board of Education in 1993 voted to prohibit yoga, hypnosis, and meditation, no meditation allowed, in public school classrooms. The ban was pushed by conservative groups. That does not sound conservative in the slightest to me. Conservative, a classical conservative, does not believe in banning the individual actions of a person. Maybe because it's a public school, I don't know. In 1993, Alabama yoga ban got the attention in, in, in 2018 when an old document circulated listing yoga among, along with games like tag among inappropriate activities in gym class. Tag was inappropriate? <laughs> no. I've never been to Alabama. <laughs> And I can I, I just gotta say after reading this here, I, I want I want no part of it. I want no part of a state <laughs> with that kind of mentality. <sighs> Do you live in a rural area? I live in a rural area. I get good uh, good internet though. I get good internet all the way from Albuquerque because they they pumped cable cable internet on out here. Everybody that lives in a, in a rural area does not get good internet. However, to the rescue comes Starman. Well, the guy that created Starman. Well, the guy that used the Starman name <laughs> for his little spaceship. Elon Musk says Starlink latency will be good enough for competitive gaming. Great. Starlink will be great in rural areas, but will not have a band enough bandwidth in big cities. Well, it, it's talking about, it's mixing terminology here because uh, the latency and the bandwidth are totally separate issues. But that's all right. This is posted on uh, ArsTechnica.com on March 10th. SpaceX's Starlink satellite broadband will have latency low enough to support competitive online gaming and will generally be fast enough that customers won't have to think about internet speed, Elon Musk said at a conference yesterday. Uh, despite that, SpaceX CEO argued that Starlink won't be a major threat to the telcos because the satellite service won't be good enough for high population areas and will mostly be used by rural customers without access to fast broadband. So they're talking about latency, which is ping time, which you could have awesome ping time on on dial up. Um which so talking about fast broadband and latency and co mingling those terms is is some kind of a clusterfuck there. I I, I don't I don't understand why why he's doing that. 
I, <laughs> it makes no sense. That's all right. It will be a pretty good experience because it will be very low latency, Musk said in a Q&A Q &A session at the Satellite 2020 conference. We're targeting latency below 20 milliseconds, which is very decent, by the way. Yeah, that, that's that's very decent. Um, so, so somebody could play a fast response video game at a competitive level, like that's the threshold for, for the, the threshold for latency. A latency of less than 20 milliseconds would make Starlink comparable to wired broadband service. Um, let me tell you, I get about a nine millisecond ping when I am not using my VPN. And when I have a VPN on, depending on the server I use, I get between 20 and 80. Uh, so it varies uh, when, you're, when you're going through a VPN. But, again, I don't do online gaming, so <laughs> eh, I, I don't really notice uh, too much the, the latency issue here. Um, uh, and I would imagine most people, they have better things to worry about than uh, their, their, their ping times. Anyway, so when when SpaceX first began talking about its satellite plans in late 2016, it said it would be between 25 to 35 milliseconds. But Musk has been predicting sub-20 millisecond latency since May of 2019, with the potential for sub-10 millisecond latency. That's terrific. Uh, what, 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 what is your bandwidth? The amount of bandwidth available will be enough to support typical Internet usage. Whatever that means, at least in the rural areas, Musk said, the bandwidth is a very complex question. But let's just say somebody will be able to watch high-def movies, play video games, and do all the things they want to do without noticing speed. Yeah, all right. Uh, so will Starlink be a good option for anyone in the U.S.? Not necessarily. Uh, Musk said there will be plenty of bandwidth in areas with low population densities, and there will be some customers in big cities, but he cautioned against expecting that everyone in a big city would be able to use Starlink. Uh, the challenge for anything in space that is space-based is the size of the cell is gigantic. It's not good enough for high-density situations, Musk said. We'll have some small number of customers in L.A., but we can't do a lot of customers in L.A. because the bandwidth per cell just ain't high enough. Um, anyway, you could read through this. I, I don't think he mentions a price in here at all. I, I read through this when I first read it, but that's been well, over a month ago. Uh, he, I don't think he mentions a price or anything like that, uh, what, the, what the bandwidth will be in the low-density areas, uh, such as where I live or uh, maybe where Christine lives, which is even a lower density than... Uh, than where I'm at, much lower density. Um, <laughs> but uh, but it may, if it's a better price and and it's and it's up to speed, what the hell? And will it be consistent? Will, will it still do good? Uh, satellite internet has never been really good uh, during um, rough weather periods. <sighs> do you have a pet pig? <laughs> All right, the answer the answer is probably no to almost all of you. There may be a pig, somebody out there that's got a pig as a pet, and more power to you if you do, your own little Arnold Ziffel. But if you have a pig and you use a pedometer to walk, to, to tell you how many miles you walked, don't, don't mix them. <laughs> From LiveScience.com. Pig... Poops out a pedometer. Starts a fire. This is, this is posted on March 9th. The copper in the battery sparked the pig pen blaze. Yep. A fire on a farm in North England was accidentally set by one of the pigs. The fire pig, fire hog, had swallowed a pedometer worn by one of its fellow pigs. Oh, it was the pedometer was on a pig. Okay, to demonstrate that the animals were free-range. But after the pig excreted the pedometer, copper in the battery sparked a flame in the pig dung and dried hay bed bedding on March 7th at approximately 2 p.m. Uh, the fire spread to cover about 807 square feet. 
Oh, boy. <laughs> Pig poop pedometer fire. PPP. <laughs> Pig poop pedometer. All right. <laughs> There's images and videos and such like that there in that article. Uh, and more to the story, too, should you care to read. I'm already over my time, so I'm kind of brushing on through these. Now, this is another PSA. For those of you that don't like to be tracked and traced and hear every word you say monitored, this might be for you. Posted February 15th on Futurism.com. This cyberpunk bracelet jams any spying microphones nearby. A team of computer science professors at the University of Chicago have invented a special bracelet that jams any nearby microphones, including ones in the smart speakers and assistants. Assistants. The admittedly chunky bracelet of science features 24 speakers capable of emitting imperceptible ultrasonic signals and nearby microphones detect these high frequencies as static-like noise that drowns out any speech and aware uh, would be having private conversations. It's so easy to record these days, Pedro Lopez, assistant professor at the University of Chicago, who worked on the project, told the Times. This is a useful defense. When you have something private to say, you can activate in real time uh, when they play back the recording, it's just the, the sound is going to be gone. The smart speakers and their microphones have become ubiquitous over the last couple of years. According to the national public media, 24% of U.S. adults now have a smart speaker in their homes, choosing to hand their privacy off to the likes of Amazon and Google. Well, let me just say, you don't have to have a smart speaker in your home. If you have a cell phone, a smartphone... There you go. There's your smart speaker. There's your smart microphone that monitors everything you got to say. For now, and the, the, the smartphone does far more than monitor what you got to say. It has to monitor where you are. It's got dual video cameras, most of them. Uh, it monitors who you're with, who you're talking to, what things you're looking at at a store, uh, on the Internet, whatever. <laughs> so, so the, the smart speakers are bad. But your cell phone is far worse. For now, the cyberpunk bracelet remains to be a prototype. But researchers, according to the researchers, they could be manufactured for only 20 bucks. The future is to have all these devices around you. But you will have to assume they are potentially compromised. Uh, ben Zayo, computer science professor at the University of Chicago, who has worked on the project, told New York Times, your circle, a circle of trust will have to be much smaller sometimes down to your actual body. Now, let me say, uh, this is a great idea, and I, I really like it, um, that, that you could actually filter, I mean, uh, dr drown out the noise from your, yourself. But if this becomes a thing, if people start wearing these and drowning out uh, all of the, the noises, the sounds around them, it's not hard to filter out the ultrasonic sound and so they can get back to your sound. Uh, <laughs> just uh, just a, a low band, uh, band, band pass filter there. And, uh, and uh, they can have you right there where they want you. <laughs> all right, folks. All right. That's going to wrap it up here for the Grim Leftovers for this week. Thank you all so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure. I've had a good time. As you can probably tell by listening to me, I enjoy doing this. <laughs> now i'll be back again next week with episode 68 of the grim leftovers show on i'll be here on friday night with the mighty moose girl uh at the freakers ball 11 p.m and i'll be on sunday yeah, i do three shows every week uh with the blues the, the blues show is not really a show it's just music so uh yeah that, that's fun uh anyway so um tomorrow check out the uh uh in a perfect world with flash somebody um, and, and look at the schedule on reallibertymedia.com for all the rest of the shows that come out throughout the week or come on throughout the week here on RLM Radio, reallibertymedia.com, rlmradio.xyz. Have a great night. 
Stay away from people. Peace.